Speaker. Uh, Mr. Hume, Vice President of our Dean Burgan Society, uh, Dr. Hollywood is one of them, and Dr. Robert Barnett is the second one, uh, taking the place of Brother Stewart, who probably better resign from active duty as far as the Vice Presidency. He's done an excellent job of getting all the speakers lined up, and we appreciate that so much. And he's going to be speaking to us, uh, another 25-minute message, uh, and it's standing and staying balanced in Bible defense. Brother Barnett, take it easy. Honest, but preach hard. Well, hey, well, thank you, Dr. Ray. Well, I'm happy to be with you today, I tell you. And I'm going to present to you something very, very unusual. Talking about staying balanced, you know, the Bible says, well, before I get started, I'd like to thank the church. I Just personally, Pastor Reno and all of them, they've just treated us just absolutely wonderful, haven't they? Just, just, just absolutely wonderful, and uh, the fellowship, and it's, it's just been great. And uh, I just want to thank each and every one of them. Uh, you know, the Bible says, "Let love be without dissimulation," and you know that word means hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. A lot of talk about love in Christian circles today. But Paul goes on to define that. He says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Yeah. You're going to love the truth. You're going to hate error. I've got error in my left hand. I've got truth in my right hand. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, We're reminded people say, Well, what Bible should I use? Well, what makes you think it's your choice? It's God's revelation. It's God's Word. It's not man's Word. Man has tried to take it over. Now, if you want to know which choice should I have, well, you've got uh, over a hundred versions. You've got thousands of Greek manuscripts. You can't go through all of that. Uh, even on our side, Dr. Waite's got over 900 uh, different different titles. You can't even read all the good stuff, let alone all the bad stuff. And so your position is going to be a faith position. I don't care what it is. And you're either going to trust God who gave us this book, or you're going to trust scholars. Now this 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 Bible here. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I, won't, I don't even want to call it that. A new translation and commentary by Robert W. Funk and Roy W. Hoover in the Jesus Seminar. The search for the authentic words of Jesus, the five Gospels. What did Jesus really say? See, we got that in red. And we, we are reminded now that you're going to trust. Now, these. by the way, this is called the Scholar's Bible. The scholar's version. They entitled it. They call themselves that. And so if you want to see where scholarship goes, here it is. This is the last word in scholarship. Now, if you want to know what faith says, this is the last word in faith. Amen. Amen. Now, it's complicated. Are you going to take a theological approach based upon the promises of God? Are you going to take a naturalistic approach based upon the opinions of men. That's the two choices. Now, we are reminded as we look at this scholar's version, they say, and I quote now, the scholar's version is authorized by scholars. They say, now, voting was adopted after extended debate as the most effective way to ascertain whether a scholarly consensus existed on a given point. Committees created a critical text of the Greek New Testament under the auspices of the United Bible Societies vote on whether to print this or that text and what variants to consign to notes. Oh, I've got that. That's what I had when I was in Bible college. That's the United Bible Society's Greek, Greek New Testament. That's an eclectic text. You know how the text is determined? By vote of the scholars. That's the way they determine it, by vote of the scholars. Now, 
since they've already said that, and they said uh, since these other people did it that way, and this is the foundation for most all of the modern versions, then we are following the same approach here in our version. Now, in this particular Greek New Testament, they say, and I have reproduced it for you, by means of the letters A, B, C, and D, enclosed within brackets at the beginning of each set of textual variants, the committee has sought to indicate the relative degree of certainty arrived at on the basis of internal considerations as well as of external evidence for the reading adopted as the text. The letter A signifies that the text is virtually certain while B indicates that there's some degree of doubt. The letter C means that there's considerable degree of doubt whether the text or apparatus contains a superior reading while D shows that there's a very high degree of doubt concerning the reading selected for the text. Now that's the Greek that the NIV is based upon. Right there. You got now whether it's A, B, C, or D as to how much faith you can put in it. <laughs> and it's vote by the scholars. Well, I'll give that one an A. Well, no, I'll give it a D. Well, we've got to take a vote and we'll see what, it, what we come up with. And almost all modern versions follow some uh, text that is basically the same Westcott and Hort critical text approach. Now, since the United Bible Society has voted using the letters A, B, C, and D to determine the authority of the verses, phrases, and words in the modern text, we're reminded the Jesus Seminar scholars said, well, uh, we're going to copy their methods, and so they created a new red letter translation which cast doubt and denial on the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all this deals with, this new translation. All it deals with is what did Jesus really say? They got that in red. And the words of Jesus that they believe are real are in red. Now, now let's hear how they said they were going to do it. The model of the red letter edition suggested that the uh, seminar should adopt one of two options in its votes. Either Jesus said it or he did not say it. A vote recognizing the words as authentic would entail printing the items in red. A vote recognizing the words as inauthentic meant that they would be left in regular black print. Academics do not like simple choices. The seminar adopted four categories as a compromise, they like that word, with those who wanted more. In addition to red, we permitted a pink vote. There's a lot of pinks in the, among the liberals. <laughs> For those who want to hedge, there's a lot of hedging among liberals. A pink vote represented reservations. There's a lot of reservations among liberals. Either about the degree of certainty or about modification, modification, the saying or parable had suffered in the course of his transmission and recording. And for those who wanted to avoid a flat negative vote, oh, and liberals just hate to appear negative. Yeah. Huh? Oh, they just don't want to be negative. They want to be loving. Yeah. Even if they're tearing down our Lord Jesus Christ, they don't want to appear negative. So we allowed a gray vote. Oh, gray is a beautiful color for liberals, isn't it? Yeah. Gray being a weak form of black. <laughs> the seminar employed colored beads dropped into voting boxes in order to permit all members to vote in secret. Oh, that's another great word for liberals. Secret. Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah. Right. yeah. The NASB, nobody knows who the translators were. That's secret. Yeah. Well, then they say uh, they're going to keep it secret. Beads and boxes turned out to be a fortunate choice for both fellows and an interested public. I imagine they didn't want to tell them who, who voted that way. Anyhow, they divide, they split up. They couldn't be satisfied with just four votes, red, uh, pink, uh, gray, or black, and so they divided each one of them into two more options. <laughs> yeah, they had eight options you could vote on how authentic these words of Jesus were. 
I'll just read the, the red vote to show you that even when they gave a red vote, they did not necessarily mean that those words were spoken by Jesus Christ. Option one for a red vote, quote, I would include this item unequivocally in the database for determining who Jesus was. Well, it's good enough we can put it in the computer to see who Jesus was. That's what they said. The second option is, Jesus undoubtedly said this, or something very like it. He may not even have said it, but he said something close to that. So we'll say it's red. That's what they said. They left 82% of the words of Jesus Christ not in red. Either in gray or black. In the Gospel of John that describes Jesus Christ as God, his deity, they did not have a single word that Jesus said in red. Not a single word out of the entire Gospel of John. Now they put, they put the Gospel of Thomas in there with some red. Yeah. Now, Let's look at what they, why they said they put no words of Jesus in red. They said Jesus did not make claims for himself. The early Christian community allowed its own triumphant faith to explode in confessions that were retrospectively attributed to Jesus, its authority figure. The climax of that trajectory came with the Gospel of John. In John, Jesus does little other than make claims for himself. For that reason alone, scholars regard the fourth gospel as alien to the real Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth. Yeah. All the words in red deal with social subjects like not resisting uh, rendering to Caesar and not resisting evil and turning another cheek, giving away your coat, going a second mile, loving your enemies, and all of those things they got. No gospel. In the Lord's Prayer, our Father is the only words in red. Preparing people for the government of Antichrist. But now they, you know, it's interesting. Everybody compares yourself to the King James Bible. You know what they said? They, they, uh, they, they considered the King James as a standard to replace. And here's why they, they said it was so hard to replace the King James. They said, quote, the beauty and cadence of the King James Bible has retarded any interest in replacing it for more, uh, more, uh, a more accurate reading. Theological conservatism also functioned as a retarding factor since many cardinal points rested on the English vocabulary of that version. They went on to say the dominance of the King James Version, 1611, the English-speaking world, stalled further work on a critical Greek text for two and a half centuries. Yeah, they admit that it was God's standard. But the interesting thing about this is they're coming out of the closet for a fight. Roman Catholic scholar John uh, Dominic uh, Corsan, co-chairman of the Jesus Seminar, who was quoted in the July 10th, 1994 issue of Time magazine saying, quote, In the past there was an implicit deal. You scholars can go off to the universities and write journals and say anything you want. Now the scholars are coming out of the closet demanding public attention for the way they think. And they're saying anybody that goes witch hunting for scholars today lacks academic credentials. In other words, you're a dummy if you call that book into question. That book is pure blasphemy. You want to know how many words? You want to know how many words are in red? Get this to where we can where we can can get it. Do you see the colors? Well very little. Very little. Hardly none. And of course you know what the attack is. This was phase one of the Jesus seminar, which dealt with the question, what did Jesus really say? Do you know what phase two is going to deal with? 
What did Jesus really do? You know, you know where they're headed? Total denial and destruction of the Christian faith. The person, work, and word of Jesus Christ. Now, I ask you the question. Is somebody balanced? That holds a book like that? You say, well, that's ridiculous. Only a fool would be balanced it with, why am I, I'm going to have to wash my hands for a half hour when I get on here. <laughs> but is one balanced who rejects this scholar's Bible yet defends versions like the NIV and the NASV and the rest of them that are based upon a critical Greek text that utilizes the same methods? They voted to come up with the NIV and the NASB, A, B, C, and D, as to how much faith you can put in it. They voted as to whether the words of Jesus are real or not. And, they, and they're going to, I can already tell you, the end of it is, they're going to pitch it. Now, we are reminded that the uh, Syrian recension is dead. Dr. Brainine brought that out. Uh, it's no no scholar believes in it anymore. Uh, also, we're reminded that uh, Wilbur Pickering, in his book, covered that, and I I put it in in my paper. I'm not going to get into it because it's already it's already been covered, and I'm getting way behind. Now, is one balanced who rejects the scholar's Bible and all the modern versions, and yet goes along with the new majority? Greek text. Well, Don Champion just told us about the Robinson uh, Pureport text, and that's got at least 1,500 changes to the Texas Receptus. Well, so also as a Hodges and Farstead, which uh, Jack Mormon said uh, in his book when the KJV departs from the majority text, there's a textual halfway house based upon the 1913 uh, edition of liberal uh, Herman von Soden. Uh, it's already been ascribed as full of errors. Uh, he was a rationalist. He was in the Alexandrian camp. He only used about 414 manuscripts. Uh, he never cover, covered any of the 2,143 lectionaries or any of the writings of the fathers or the virginal evidence. And for the book of Revelation, all he used was the writings of or the work of uh, Hoxier and uh, who followed the old 46 group of manuscripts instead of the Andreas groups underlying the King James Bible. So that's why they came up with uh, approximately 1,800 alterations to the received text. Can you follow that? Of course, I don't think you can be balanced and follow such garbage. Now, are we balanced when we accept by faith the providentially preserved uh, text in the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek underlying the King James Bible? Especially in light of the corruption of the, of the first four centuries, which everybody admits that's where most of the corruption took place. Well, I, I've listed 12 reasons why we should accept uh, the, that as logically uh, defensible. The original autographs probably lasted 200 years, according to the testimony of Tertullian. Uh, Jews were the primary individuals responsible. They'd had 15 years of experience. God had ordained them to preserve the Old Testament scriptures, Romans 3, 2. Public reading of the scriptures would have uh, brought, uh, assured us of balance and textual transmission. It was a choice of the churches, and they had all the evidence at the time of the 4th century. Uh, it's the only unbroken Bible line, and Dr. Wade has listed the 37 links in the unbroken Bible line of received text Bibles. It's the Believer's Bible, point six. It's the Martyr's Bible, point seven, including Tyndale. This is five, six to nine tenths Tyndale, the King James uh, Archaeology. And again, we talked about Pickering's book. Uh, the promises of Jesus that he would send the Spirit who would guide us into all truth the fact that the work of the Holy Spirit has given us 
uh, words, not which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Uh, the writings of the early church fathers, which is said could replace the entire New Testament if necessary. Uh, the profitability of the received text in the Reformation, revivals, missionary work, Christian education, etc. Well, it's logical to accept it. We don't need logic. All we need is faith. But we don't have to go contrary to logic to exercise faith in this book. The Syrian recension is dead. Westcott and Hoyt's theories are dead. The truth prevails. And certainly, do we want to go again all of the uh, uh, received text uh, Bibles that Dr. Wade has listed? And I reproduced them here again. And Dr. Wade has made an excellent statement, and I've reproduced his statement, and I concur with it 100%. I'd like to remind you the verse of Scripture, which to me is tremendous, Isaiah 59, 20, and 21. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. I like that. Uh, Peter Van Cleek calls that an intra-Trinitarian covenant. A covenant involving the Son as the Redeemer, the Father, the Holy Spirit, to assure and promise and guarantee that he is putting the covenant of redemption, which is this book I hold in my hand, in our mouth. Starting way back there and keeping it there, generation by generation, forever. Now, I ask a question. If the revealed plan and purpose and power of the Holy Trinity to carry out divine providential preservation of Holy Scriptures, if a person can't trust God to keep his own promise concerning his own word, how can you trust this book for the salvation of your soul? A man that can... I'd sell him the Brooklyn Bridge if he could. He's stupid. If God can't keep his word, he can't keep your soul. He has kept his word. Amen? Amen. It's right here. I think the late Dr. David Otis Fuller and Brother... Who read that earlier? Uh, that letter? One, one of the brothers, Brother, uh, read it. I think it's, it, it's excellent. I repeat it. He said, I'm convinced beyond all doubt or question the main most important issue by far facing fundamentalists today is summed up in two questions. One, do we have now, not in the originals, which have been lost for centuries and in my book is one of the worst cop-outs anyone ever uttered. I repeat, do we have now the true, pure, and errant, inspired word of God is found in the King James Version? Two, what kind of a God do we worship? If he cannot and will not keep his word pure and true down through the ages right up to 1988, then we have one option left. Let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die and go to hell. Now, our forefathers... How much time have I got, Dr. Blake? Two minutes. Our forefathers, in the consensus of faith, on the Holy Scriptures and the Westminster Savoy Confession, the Baptist Confession, said three things. And by the way, I'm going to treat this as an infallible, in, infallibly inspired body of truth. Because of the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek from which it was translated. But number one, the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. We still have it today. We still agree with our 17th century forefathers. We have an infallible canon. Now, if you reject it, you can go follow the Catholic Church. That's your only other choice. 
And that's what, that's what they're hoping. Secondly, our full persuasion and assurance, the infallible truth, divine authority thereof, is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit's been bearing witness all those 37 links that Dr. Wade the received text all the way back from the originals the Holy Spirit is born witness in every generation to the received text as infallible assurance and thirdly how do we know we're teaching truth well they said the infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is the scripture itself and therefore, if there is a question about the true or full sense of any scripture which is not manifold but one, it must be searched by other places that speak more clearly. Let the scripture be its own infallible interpreter. An infallible canon. Infallible content assured us by the Holy Spirit and His confirmation. An infallible interpretation. Garbage and junk. 